Your words are as empty as your soul. Mankind ill needs a savior such as you. What is a what happened? A miserable little pile of secrets. But enough talk. How about you? Oh, thanks, Dracula. That's that's so, so nice. Welcome back to another stake-throwing, hero-drowning, rib-processing episode of What Happened, the show that regularly dips into the video games that didn't make the smoothest transitions to 3D. And really, no one stumbled harder or took longer to make that very transition than Castlevania, the seminal franchise that saw horror fans the world over whipping the crap out of an old man roughly every 100 years. Now, this is a legendary series of games that have no shortage of curios, misfires, red-headed stepchildren, and just plain bad entries. But today, we are opening up the dusty tome of what might be the most infamous, its first foray into the dark, mysterious dimension known as the third dimension. Anyway, it's 1995 and Konami is thinking of supporting the Sega 32X for some reason, so they put together a small team headed up by Koji Igarashi, the main scenario writer, to develop a new Castlevania game for the ill-fated add-on. But for reasons most can surmise start and end with the word 32X, the project, codenamed The Bloodletting, was quietly cancelled. Iga's team then re formed a short while later, and using some of the ideas that they had started on with the 32X version, developed one of the progenitors of the genre that's now known as Search Action. Castlevania Symphony of the Night stubbornly stuck to a 2D viewpoint when almost every other game studio was being seduced by the sexy, heaving bosoms of the temptress known as Polygons. Now, despite Symphony's critical success, at the time of its release, its commercial prospects sadly didn't match up, failing to even sell a million copies. No one knows what it's like to be the bad man. So in terms of dollars made, Iga's 2D gamble didn't quite pay off for Konami, so either anticipating this or getting their shit together real quick, they announced a new Castlevania project just one month after the release of Alucard's Wild Weekend in his dad's house. Alright! Vampires rule! Alucard, you incompetent idiot! Now, some context here. After the completion of the NES trilogy and Super CV4, the regulars who had worked on the franchise up until then had been split up, all shuffled around to different projects within Konami. That's why you saw the franchise suddenly get entries for other consoles with different ideas and teams behind them. There was Bloodlines for the Genesis, Rondo on the PC Engine, some GB titles, and so forth. But with the 3D revolution looming, Konami knew they need to form a fresh team whose goal was to specialize in 3D development, which would hopefully foster a new generation of vampire killing. And thus, Konami Computer Entertainment Kobe, or simply Konami Kobe, was formed in 1996. Their first project was the delightfully obscure Rakuga Kids, which Japan-only gamers might be familiar with. Uh, I mean Japan and European-only gamers gamers might be familiar with- Why didn't we get Rakuga kids? They followed that up with a puzzler, Susume Tyson Puzzle Dama, and a strategy Goemon title, which, as you can see on your screen here, wasn't exactly stretching the old 3D development muscles. This was an early indicator that the prospect of the first 3D Castlevania game getting the same polished, well-thought-out debuts as Mario or Link were indeed extremely cursed. Tokyo Game Show, April 1997. In a special sneak peek event, Konami revealed Castlevania 64, despite the fact that in Japan, the series is more commonly known as Akumajo Dracula, or Demon's Castle Dracula. This was probably to ensure that the announcement would grab more immediate headlines in the West, but things didn't stop there with the confusing monikers. Later that same year, Konami started calling the game Dracula 3D, with Western press calling it Dracula 64 before Konami finally settled on simply Castlevania, dropping the 64 entirely. 
the final Japanese name, for whatever reason, wound up being Akumaju Dracula Apocalypse. <sighs> for the sake of this video, it is Kids Castlevania 64. TGS 97 was the earliest known public showing of the game, and I'm talking early. Those of you who are Nintendo Power OGs will recognize these screenshots of various 3D models posing in lifeless gray backgrounds, with many of those same characters never even appearing in the final game. Something we're gonna dig into. This was all a pretty clear sign that Konami was hoping to stoke the fires of excitement as soon as humanly, vampirely as possible. Ah, oh, I'm sorry. Now, the game was revealed in April, right? New previews started popping up in gaming magazines six months later in and around September, many of which stated that the game was 10% completed. Uh, game development is hard, we all know this, but 10% in six months is a bit sussy, which means it will be a running theme of this episode, as most of the work on Castlevania 64 was done in the last few frenzied months of development. In a Japanese interview, Takeo Yakushiji, a planner on the project, divulged that the team struggled early on. Because most of the staff was developing for the Nintendo 64 and developing 3D games for the first time, it was difficult just starting the project more than anything else. Since the know-how and the limits of 3D production were not known, it was difficult to reproduce the visual ideas that the creators imagined on the hardware in the early stages of development. In fact, this unfamiliarity with 3D hardware and taking a series like Castlevania, which often prided itself on 2D design, and all the aspects therein would be the biggest hurdle the team needed to overcome. Just the act of having illustrators design characters that would look appealing on a page but also translate well to 3D was actually among the main reasons the staff spent almost all of 1997 stuck in a sludgy bog of unproductivity. In terms of characters, Castlevania had many beautiful ones like Richter, Maria, and Alucard. It was difficult to create a leading character with presence, including appearance and personality. Reinhardt and Carrie were difficult to design at first, but after a while, sub-characters such as Malice, Rose, and Vincent were created relatively smoothly. Ah yes, the characters, I had mentioned that earlier. When the first previews and interviews went out for CB64 back in 97, much noise was made about the fact that the game was to incorporate four distinct playstyles which would need four similarly distinct vampire hunters. This was the team trying to incorporate ideas from the series past into their work, with this particular feature coming from Dracula's Curse. That game highlighted a lineup of heroes including Trevor, Sypha, Alec, but now who cares about them? It's all about Grant Mr. Nasty to Nasty, yeah. Look at your fine self. <coughs> <coughs> Anyway, Konami Kobe drafted up its own squad with mm, similar parallels. Reinhard Schneider took up the Belmont Whip, Carrie Fernandez was to be the stand-in for the Belnades clan, Cornell was a martial arts master and furry enthusiast, and finally, the totally not awkwardly named Caller, uh, who was to be a Goliath-like tank of the group. Now, his offensive capabilities were a bit different than the rest, mainly due to them revolving around a shotgun and sh chainsaw? Wait, wait, wait a minute! Oh, well, okay, that checks out then. Groovy. Now, I tip my hat to the Kobe team for swinging for the fences here, as that is indeed a nice nod to the cap-off of the NES trilogy. They did, however, divulge these plans way too early, and they were also way, way too ambitious for this being their first 3D action adventure. Since they had so much trial and error just getting the two most important characters up and running, which would be the whip and magic user, the uh, werewolf and weird... The evil dead guy would be the first major cuts the game saw, although they wouldn't be the last. Tomohiro Morisawa, a character designer, recalls the specific problems they had with just the heroes they were prioritizing. 
For Reinhardt, I had difficulty creating a macho-like image at first, and I was very confused because the body shape had not been decided yet. As for Carrie, at first she was barefoot, and when her skirt fluttered, it turned out to be less than a desirable view, so I gave her some black stockings. We just had a hard time with everything. As we designed it, the team took it really seriously to make the world of Dracula, an image that had been established in 2D, and convert it into 3D without destroying it. The game made very slow progress throughout 1998, and it was only up until October at that year's TGS did the team finally start to gain forward momentum, which just so happened to be the same time they announced they were cutting the cast in half. Many other smaller features were also axed around this time. Beta versions had a variety of differences, and digging into the game's code showed unused items like an engagement ring that Carrie could wear, which seems to have been linked to some unused story elements involving Dracula himself. Also, there seemingly was, at a point, RPG-like trappings, as certain stats were once present in the game, with particular pieces of gear affecting them. Even some elements of collar were repurposed for the gardener enemy who appears in the villa surrounding the castle. Oh good, I was starting to feel like a real dick. The decision to cut all these elements probably happened around September of 1998, as the game was definitely going to miss out on the lucrative holiday season of that year, so anything that could be dropped would need to, as it was now... It's 1999! And Konami still didn't have a Castlevania title to take advantage of the 3D revolution. So CV64 was finally pegged for a release on January 26th, which was probably for the best. There was a lot of competition on a variety of systems at the tail end of 98. The reviews were actually pretty fair at the time, although there were still a good deal below most of Nintendo, Capcom, and Sony's major offerings. The reviews that skewed more towards the negative honed in on a few particular things. The starting area of CV64 is actually the most hideous in the game, featuring ugly textures, barren landscapes, and a drab color palette. Just, it makes for a poor first impression. In terms of mechanics, despite there being a number of selectable cam reviews, none of them were worked especially well, something that saw the game's already tricky platforming sections being far harder to navigate than they should have been. Finally, some mission objectives were also criticized in their basic design, being somewhat cryptic or tedious. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Life sucks. Uh, actually, on that same note, it was mostly the fan reactions surrounding the game, which seemingly doomed it from then on out, and uh, who could blame them? There were lots of games released by 1999 that were nailing 3D, and really, Castlevania 64 felt a little launch gamey by comparison. Not only that, but when you put it side by side with Symphony, released almost two years earlier, it was easily outclassed in a lot of areas. On the positive side, though, what most people did agree on was CV64's excellent score and sound design, which was a rarity with the N64's limited audio capabilities. Fortunately, being rushed by Konami to finish left a bunch of content on the cutting room floor just twiddling its fingers, and in a nice twist, the Kobe team were given a second chance at redemption. Castlevania Legacy of Darkness, or <sighs> Demon Castle Dracula Apocalypse Guide and Legend of Cornell was both a special edition and prequel to Reinhardt and Carrie's adventure, and remains one of the most unique and rare games in Castlevania's history. It firmly placed Cornell the werewolf in the title role, and chronicled his quest to save his sister from Dracula's creepy clutches, cause you see, even in the best circumstances, werewolves and vampires don't get on. We're just about to walk past a werewolf so some shit might go down. We don't want any trouble. I do. Why don't you go smell your own crutches, huh? Oh, come on, what are you talking about? The game saw some serious improvements, from the camera and the controls, to even the level design and the graphics. Slapping that expansion pack, yeah! 
and added brand new areas for Cornell to explore. The majority of the game still reused locales from CB64, but they were heavily modified from their original versions. What's more is that the game fulfilled the prophecy of its predecessor and featured four playable characters, as Reinhardt and Carrie could be unlocked, although their quests were not unique. Finally, Caller appears once more, and much like Frankenstein's monster, was split up and reused in a different manner. He was now Henry Oldry, a knight who uses a gun as his main attack, sadly dropping the chainsaw in the process. You bastards. He isn't, however, playable in the main game, and instead has his own mini-campaign where he needs to rescue children. Sort of like Resident Evil's Hunk. Well, I mean not the children part. While this was an improved sequel in pretty much every way, Castlevania 64's bad rap kinda rubbed off here, and Legacy of Darkness saw worse scores because of it. What's more is that its marketing and distribution was greatly reduced in the wake of the lukewarm reception 64 received earlier that that year, and not many fans got to really experience this unique release. The Kobe team wouldn't see much action for the next several years, only putting out several Japan-only Goemon and Rhythm games. Luck did finally smile on them once again in 2001, as they returned to the impossibly spiky spires and dark clouds of Castlevania with Circle of the Moon, which is one of the most critically and fan-lauded games in the franchise, and made for a very successful GBA debut, managing something the franchise had failed to do up to that point, sell over a million copies. Koji Igarashi, who wasn't involved with Circle of the Moon, wasn't really a fan, citing the darker graphical look as a negative, and felt that the game's card system wasn't a good fit for the series, and wrote it out of the official CV timeline in 2009. Uh, dude, that would be solved. Despite its overwhelming success, the Kobe team's offices were closed and the staff were folded back into other departments within Konami Osaka without much of a reason given. It's a real shame because they were put in an unenviable position here, asked to complete a monumental task with little experience or know-how, and just as they seemed to be getting the hang of the vampire killer, they were just as quickly vanquished themselves. In an interview with IGN just a few months before Legacy of Darkness's release, a question was posed to the game's director, Yuji Shibata, which I think sums things up. What did you learn from your experience of making Castlevania 64? How to program in 3D and make a 3D action game. Ah, the children of the night, they call, but before I bid you all farewell, if you are privy to any other sordid little tales of video game vitriol, then hunt me down on Twitter or stalk the hallowed halls of the Flophouse VIP castle and become a Dark Lord of the Night to nominate the next quarry I will hunt for in a future video. I will count the days until we meet again, and I thank you for your patronage. Grace, out of my castle, you deadbeat! Hey! You can't kick me out! I'll show you! You just wait and see!